respecter of people. Amen? By the way, good and bad. You're like, when he wiped out people because they judge and because they, they refuse to repent and all the rest, I want you to know that also is going to happen. That's why we need to pay attention to the things that he does so we can learn lessons. But this is something I want you to learn. You can claim. So he heals this guy in the story. Everyone shout yay. yay. And you can claim that for yourself. There are miracles that God did for others that he will do for you. All right? So we'll do them. But what a lot of people miss is when God does a miracle for people, he, they, you tend to miss some of the other things that he's doing. Because oftentimes when God does something for someone, he does it, he'll do a miracle, he'll write something in their life, but he's also going to speak to an underlying issue that's in the person's life so he could deal with that issue in that person's life. Does that make sense? Like, in other words, he might do something that's miraculous, but he does it in such a way that he wants to illustrate something and have you deal with an issue in your life that he needs to repair and improve. Is that making sense? All right, if it makes sense, say yes. yes. All right, cool. So he does this. Well, if you pay even closer attention, and this happens in this story, if you pay even closer attention, you'll see that he doesn't just make a deal with an issue in this guy's life, but he's also speaking a message through the things that he does. Oftentimes, things he does in your life becomes a message for other people as well. Does that make sense? And if you pay close enough attention to a third level, you'll see that he not only makes the point of the message he's speaking, but he'll often repeat the message and amplify the message, and that totally happens in this story. And maybe all of you got it already, but I just wanted to prep you for it because that's kind of happening in this. So let's take a look at this story real quick. So in this story, there's a guy. Everyone say, there's a guy. Okay, there's this guy. And this guy has friends like we should be friends in somebody's life. Amen? I was sitting outside the hotel this morning, you know, waiting for Pastor to come pick me up for lunch. And we, I was sitting outside, and I got to a conversation with some of the people that were there at the hotel. And I got to tell you, that was one of the most intriguing conversations ever. A lady comes up. She's a grandmother, and, she, and her grandson and some other people got out of the car. I have no idea what they were doing at the hotel. But she gets out, and we're all talking to all the rest. And come to find out, this grandmother is married to some other woman. I mean, she kept calling her her wife and all the rest. And she's talking about her life and talking about how this person that she's supposed married to is already going to divorce her because she's already run off with some other woman. And I'm sitting there listening to this whole thing, and I'm listening to all of her issues and all the things that have happened in her life, and I'm like, wow, it doesn't take very long to find out what all your issues are and why you've gone down the path you've gone in your life. Because, I mean, seriously, you're messed up. You, don't, you, don't, uh, you obviously are hurting over a whole bunch of things that are going on in your life. Well, the other lady that was talking to her, she's talking. She goes, yeah, my old man, who is the father of her five-year-old uh, uh, son, she goes, my old man, he's in prison for the next 30 months, so I just dumped him, and I got this other guy, and then... You know, my, the grandmother of my son, the mother of this guy who's now in prison, well, you know, uh, that guy, uh, uh, she's all mad at me, this woman, she's all mad at me because, you know, she came over and found a guy who was naked in my bed, and that's the guy I'm now hooked up with. And, you know, because I dumped him, I dumped her son, which is the guy who's in prison, a week ago. And I'm like, man, it only took you a week to end up in bed with another person. This is not heading for good. <laughs> I'm like, who needs to watch TV when you're listening to this stuff? This is awesome. <sighs> I mean, awesome, not in like an awesome, but like awesome kind of way. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the bottom line is, I'm like, look, people are hurting. They make horrible decisions. I mean, this is, I just feel for this. Are you hearing me? Right? So I'm listening to this stuff, and I'm listening, and I'm thinking, you know, all y'all need is Jesus. So I started, I interjected myself, because they were talking in front of me, not even recognizing I was sitting there the whole time. So at one point, when they said something, I lost track of who they were talking about. I said, excuse me. And they both looked at me, because I shocked them. And I said, is that the guy that you're, like, hooked up with who's in prison, or was that the other guy she was talking about? And they're looking at me, and they're like... Who are you? I said, I'm so sorry, but I just like, I feel like I'm related to you guys because, you know, I mean, so I had a fun time. And that's when you pulled up at the end of the conversation. I was asking her about her car. Well, anyway, so, I mean, you might as well interject yourself. Can I get an amen? Right? But you know what? These people don't need friends who will look at them and say, you are nothing but a beady eyed little sinner and you're dying and going to hell, which is happens to be the truth. But the fact is, that's not what they need. What they need is friends like this guy had in their lives. 
Because this blind guy who cannot see had friends who were desperate for him to get to Jesus. In other words, I'm not desperate to point out to people what their sins are. I, I want them to know their sins. I'm desperate for them to get to Jesus. Because he's the only one can unravel that whole mess. You know, I heard in about 10 minutes when I was sitting out there waiting for pastor about more problems in two people's lives than a whole village should have. You know what I'm saying? You know, and I'm listening to this and I'm going, you know what? These people need Jesus. And it reminded me why this church exists and why we're here. Amen? Amen. We can never stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. As long as we have breath in our nostrils, there should be hope for others. Amen? Amen? Not just for ourselves. So, you know what? This guy in the story, though, he had friends that loved him. These are friends that cared about him. And these friends went to him and said, man, you got to come to Jesus. You got to come to him. And they got this guy and they grabbed him and they brought him to Jesus. Can somebody shout amen? amen? Oh, that somebody in this room believed that somehow Jesus could change somebody's life. Is there anybody who believes Jesus could change somebody? Oh, that there was somebody who believes that God can heal all the diseases and solve all the problems in people's lives. Is there anybody in this room who believes that? Oh, that there's somebody who doesn't just believe that he can, but believes that he actually will. You know, there's a big difference between saying he can and he will. I look at people all the time and I tell them, Jesus will solve your problems. And they're like, well, I heard he could do that. And I said, no, 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 you didn't hear me. I said, he will solve your problems, and we're talking in real time like now? <laughs> Hello? Right? I mean, Jesus wants to solve people's problems in real time. And we're always leaving it for the sweet by and by. What happened? We were like, well, Jesus can handle this problem. It's kind of like, uh, uh, who was it, uh, Martha, when she came to Jesus after her brother Lazarus had died in the, in the scriptures, and she says, Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. Well, that's certainly true if you'd been there. And he says, I just want you to know something. If anybody believes in me, even if they die, they will live. He says that to her. Do you believe this, Martha? And she's like, yes, Lord. I believe he will rise in the resurrection. And it's like, Martha, he's telling you, if you believe right now, your brother is going to raise from the dead right now. But see, we're always leaving it for the sweet by and by, and God will take care of issues starting right now. Can I get an amen? We forget we serve a real-time God who solves things right now to prove to you, everybody, that there is no other way to get to heaven except through him. Oh, that somebody in this room was like a friend like that to somebody else and looked at them and said, Jesus could solve your problems in the, not just in the sweet by and by, but in the here and now. And he will do it if you let me pray for you, if I could just get you to Jesus. Oh, that there was somebody in this room who had faith like that. Is there anybody? (laughs) Listen to me, everybody in this room. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus really wants us to be friends like this. So this guy had friends like we should be in somebody's life. So they get him to Jesus. And when they get him to Jesus, what do they do? I read it to you. They pleaded with him. I love what it says actually in the Greek. It's almost like begging him. They begged him to do something about their friend. You know, that's kind of the difference in prayer. You know, a lot of times we pray, oh God, would you please like uh, solve these problems for all these people? Listen, I'll tell you what. If your grandchild, if your child if your husband or wife that you love, I mean, if you have issues, then I understand that might not like apply here. But the thing is, the one that you love very dearly, if that person was close to death or had just suffered a horrible, horrific accident, if that person had suffered it, are you going to really feel good if you give that prayer request to somebody and says, oh yeah, I wrote the prayer request down. I just put it on a stage filled with 10,000 other prayer requests and some guy who's supposedly really anointed lays on top of those prayer requests and says, oh God, meet all these needs. Is that what you're looking for? Yes or no? Be honest. Yes or no? Right. Do you want somebody who's going to pray like this? Oh, oh Lord, I do doth pray verily right now that thou mightest provide thine succor unto this, this need that Lord God may one day be answered by thee if it be thy will. Do you want somebody praying like that? Listen, man, if I'm lying close to death in a hospital bed, I don't want somebody who's going to start praying like that for me to get some sucker from God. I'd be a sucker to let somebody pray for me like that. <laughs> The bottom line is, guys, I want somebody who's yelling in tongues who has grabbed a gallon of extra virgin Bertoli olive oil and is pouring it over me while yelling in tongues while security is trying to drag them out of the room. Amen? (laughs) I mean, I want somebody who's a Holy Ghost maniac. Can I get an amen? (laughs) 
mean, that's what I'm looking for. I want them going, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I want them going nuts for God. I want somebody who prays like they really believe that God is listening. Come on. Amen. Amen. These guys got him to Jesus, and they didn't pray some liturgical prayer. They were like, oh, Jesus, do something for our friend. What is the very first thing Jesus did for the guy? Come on, tell me. I read you the story. You may have read it along. What's the very first thing they did? Took him by the hand. Where? Come on, look at it. It's in your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, shame on you. (laughs) Amen. Let him outside the village. Everyone say, took him by the hand. Let him out of the village. Oh, what God could do in your life if he could just get you outside of all your preoccupations. You know, we are so busy with so much junk. You know what, kids today, I, I feel for young families. I mean, kids today, they, you know, when I, my kids were busy when they were in school. I mean, they were in school not that long ago. They're 26 and 22. I mean, I'm talking about when they were in high school and junior high. Oh, my goodness, the things schools do now, it's almost like it's a full-time job just getting them from one thing to the next. Am I right, yes or no? It is literally ridiculous how busy they keep them doing things that are not helping them become any bit better in their lives. I mean, guys, it's one thing to learn, like, reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's one thing to do that. It is another thing when they're basically using their skills so the school can get money because they got a good sporting program. I mean, there's something wrong for parents that make sure that their kids get to sporting events and don't get them to youth group or children's ministry. There's something wrong when parents are yelling at youth pastors and telling them, hey, you know what? I came. It was already 8.30. We should have been done, and I should have been able to get them out because, you know what? I got to get them back home. Why? So they could get to bed early. Why? So they could get good sleep. Why? So they could be rested and ready for school the next day. Why? So they could get get good grades. Why? So they could get a scholarship and go to college. Why? So they could get a great degree. Why? So they could get a great job, make lots of money, and die and go to hell. Wow, that's really good. Wow, really? So we got well-educated, well-paid people who have the spiritual IQ of a doorknob. And they accomplish nothing. And then one day you're at the altar praying, oh God, my grandkids are not being raised in church. They have problems and there's all this stuff going on in their family. And you know who created the problem? You did. <laughs> you did because you told them that the most important thing is the things in this world, not the things of the, go- of the gospel. And all of a sudden, they're raised without a frame of reference that going to church and getting passionate about God and getting after the Lord is even, even important at all. Right. I mean, they're just thinking, well, the only thing that matters is making money. That's what mom and dad made most important. They used to drag me out of youth group. I was experiencing God one day. They dragged me out of youth group and got the youth pastor thrown out. That's why he's wearing sunglasses in the middle of the evening. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you, that was seriously funny. <laughs> okay. Now, listen. I'm going to tell you. Guys, we have issues, but they got this. See, Jesus, the first thing he does is getting them away from the village of doubt, unbelief, and all the entertainments and all. Oh, my goodness. If God could just get you alone for a few minutes, what he could do with your life. Oh, if Jesus could just get undivided, undistracted attention. I love telling people, you need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're like, well, I don't know. I don't believe it. You know, and all the rest of stuff. Why not? Because, well, I heard somebody once say, and people make fun of it and all the rest. You're spending more time listening to doubt and unbelief than you are reading the Bible. There are people who know a lot more about what ministries say about Jesus than what Jesus said about himself in the scriptures. Some of you have never even heard the voice of God. The Bible says, my sheep know my voice. And if you're one of his sheep and claim to be and you don't know his voice, what does that say about you being a sheep? It's very bad. I'm so sorry. I kept telling myself in my mind, don't go there. And I just went there. That's like so horrible. But anyway, hear this. All right? The point is, my friends, this is bad news. It's bad news. I mean, we need to know the voice of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. And you know what? How are we going to know it when we have all the distractions? We have the movies, the TV, the radio, and all the rest of that junk. The first thing Jesus did was took him by the hand and took him outside of the village. We got to get away from this stuff so we can hear what he has to say to us unencumbered without interference. You know, you go to some people's homes and, you know, seriously, you try to have a conversation with them and they have the TV blaring. They haven't been paying attention to what's on TV. They just, the minute they walk in, they turn it on and it's noise in the living room. And you're like, is anybody paying attention to what's on, on TV? I mean, do we have to have this on so we can have a conversation, <laughs> you know? And then I have people say, I don't like going to them Pentecostal churches. Why not? Because everybody's always lifting up their voices together. It's just everybody talking together. It's just confusing. I can't hear anything. Really? 
So let me see, do you ever have conversations in a restaurant or do you just get quiet and tell everybody in the restaurant to shut up so you can talk to the person across from you? I actually had this conversation with a lady and she looked at me and she goes, no. I said, so you don't hold conversations because you just stay quiet because everybody's talking at a restaurant and you can't even talk to the person at the grocery store because everybody's always talking. You have to wait for everybody to be silent before you could actually say something or pay attention. She goes, no. I said, it sounds to me like you have an attention deficit disorder. You can't hear what God is saying because you're too busy listening to everybody in the world. You know, listen, your lack of an attention span is not my problem. You know, just because people want to have a quick service and get out of service really fast and all the rest, that is not my issue. My, my, it's it's got to do with your cultivating your desire to be with Jesus and hear his voice. I literally have no expectation that anybody who spends most of the time feeding their flesh would like to spend longer than five minutes in the presence of God. Because honestly, it would just drive you crazy. I mean, the fact is the presence of God is going to kill you because to you, it's killing your flesh and you're feeding your flesh. Oh my goodness. I mean, how, what else do you expect? If you're always like feeding on sugar, 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 something that's a steak, it's not going to taste good to you because you're going to think, you know, sugar is better. I was raised, I was, uh, you know, my parents came from Greece and I was born when they landed in America. They landed in Chicago. I was raised in the land of really good pizza. Chicago knows what pizza is. It's this thick. It is flowing with cheese. I mean, my goodness, it is like heaven. I actually believe when Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, he was holding Chicago pizza in his hands. <gasps> I mean, the reality is that stuff was majorly good. I mean, I mean, seriously, you could get a heart attack eating one pizza, but it is so worth it. <laughs> Amen? Now, listen to me. I want to tell you something. That stuff is good. And then I have people tell me, oh, I really love pizza. And this one couple, we bring them to Chicago Pizza Place, and they go, well, you know what? I just really like Little Caesars. That's the kind of pizza we like. <laughs> I almost killed them. <laughs> I literally almost, I had a flesh flash. That means I went carnal and I'm like, I'm going to kill you, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, I just wanted to kill him. Do you understand? You know, if you feed yourself a steady diet of something that isn't God, then all of a sudden you you're in the presence of God. You're not going to like it. The problem isn't what the church is doing. The problem is what you've exposed yourself to, which is why Jesus is wanting. His hand has been out to you a long time, and he's trying to get you outside of all of these things that are distractions and are not helping you at all. Can I get an amen? amen. So when, then what he does, what does Jesus do after that? After he gets them outside of the village, he does what? He spits on them. Now, if you're looking for like a major revelation out of this, I got nothing for you, <laughs> okay? But... I do have a few conjectures. Would you like to hear my conjectures? I was explaining to the staff last Saturday. I was explaining to them because they were asking me things about my big fat Greek wedding. How many of you saw the second one? Anybody here? See, you're good people. Now, all of you need to go out and rent it, and you'll totally understand me. But hear this, okay? So they were asking me, what about in the first movie, the spitting on? Okay, for those of you who saw it, when the bride comes walking in and they're all looking at her, they all start spitting on her. The Greeks start spitting on her. How many of you remember that scene in the first movie, all right? All right, and so people ask me, why do they spit? Do you want me to explain to you why we Greeks spit on people, yes or no? Yes. And I'm not talking about when we're preaching. I mean, I'm talking about what we do on a regular basis, <laughs> all right? All right, in the Greek culture, if I look at you and I say, oh my goodness, what a lovely, anointed, awesome woman of God who looks, by the way, beautiful and blue, <laughs> all right? I'm just thinking about blueberries the entire time I'm looking at you. All right, so, so all right, I'm going to throw you on some cereal. No, okay, so, so, so here's the thing, okay? What I said to her, what a beautiful woman of God. Isn't that a blessing, what I've just pronounced to her, yes or no? Yes, yes it is. Well, the blessing I pronounce in the Greek mindset, because we Greeks are very spiritual, we understand from when we're born that there's a spirit world. We understand it. Foreign cultures just get that. All right? You don't have to explain to foreigners the idea that there is a supernatural spiritual world. That you don't have to explain to us. You know, which God we're supposed to believe in, we need to know. All right? But we understand the spirit world. Well, in the Greek mindset, even though I've just blessed her by saying something so kind to her, I've actually cursed you. I cursed you because when I said something nice, I drew the attention not only of the people in the room, but all the evil forces that are also listening on the conversation. So when I say, oh, what a lovely hairstyle, what a lovely one, what a lovely, awesome, beautiful woman of God. When I say that to her, I have now cursed her because I've drawn attention to evil. So when she walks out of this building tonight, some truck's going to run over her head and I'm responsible for that happening. Because I cursed her by drawing attention to her in front of the evil that's out there in the world. 
So the only way I could cancel the curse that my blessing brought on her is to do something that curses her. So what do I do? I do this. I say, what a beautiful anointed woman of God. <laughs> I spit at her. Why? Because my, my curse of spitting, because spitting in every culture is a curse. Yes? Even in the days of Jesus, if you spit on somebody that made you unclean and they caused you to have to be unclean and you couldn't even go to the house of God and tell you went through a cleansing process. So it's, it's a curse. So the curse that my blessing brought by saying the blessing is canceled by the curse of my spitting on her. So now she's actually blessed. It's like a double negative. Anybody get it? How many of you right now are thinking you should pray for Greek people a lot more? Come on. Right? This is what my wife married into. My, my wife literally asked me once when my family met her, they're all touching her face going, oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, they all started spitting in her face. And she's like, why are they spitting on me? And I said, they're canceling the curse they brought on you. But they said something nice. Well, they said something nice, but they said it out loud. And so therefore, the evil's going to attack you. So there's, just receive it. <laughs> Amen? Do you get it? So, so you need to understand that. But no matter which way you look at it, spitting on someone is a curse. Got it? Right? So why does Jesus spit on this guy? Well, I'm not not sure I got the, the handle on all this, but I do have a conjecture. Would you like to hear it? Remember this. At some point in your life, when God's doing things in your life, you're gonna feel in your life like God doesn't like you very much. Like, why, God, am I going through this in my life right now? I've been serving you, and why am I going through it? I feel like I'm living under a curse, God. Why are you cursing me out? And what God wants you all to know is, if the worst that comes out of God, even if it seems like it's bad, the very worst that will ever come from God is going to end up turning into the most amazing blessing in your life. Because this guy got spit on by the Savior, but the Savior healed him through his spit. So the worst thing that happens from God that you perceive as nothing but bad, it's going to end up turning into the biggest blessing in your life. Can I get an amen? You know what? When you're complaining and you're thinking, I'm under it, where is God and all the rest? You remember this story of this guy, and you remember that you may think that God has left you and God has forsaken you, but don't you ever forget that no matter what you think is going on, it's going to turn into something amazing if you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Come on, somebody ought to clap their hands and say hallelujah. (laughs) Now listen to me. Jesus spits on him, lays his hands on him. Is he completely healed instantly, yes or no? No. Now, everybody, this is where we get a lesson. God had to deal with something in this guy's life. So when he lays his hands on him and spits on him, lays his hands on him, Jesus asked him, how do you see? And what was the guy's response? Does anybody remember what I read to you? I see people, but what do they look like? Trees, they look huge, right? See, now God's got to deal with a major issue in his life and an issue that many of us in this room have. See, we've made people too big, and our God has become way too small. This guy, I promise you, has to deal with this issue because he's intimidated by people. He says, I see people, but they're walking around like trees. You know what? How many people have not fulfilled what God has asked them to do in their lives? Because somebody who's important in their life, who looms bigger than God, has caused them not to obey and do what God's asked them to do. You know, families, I've seen young people, young people who have the call of God in their life who completely get derailed in their walk with God because parents use money to say, if you do this, and no daughter, no son of mine is going to be some preacher begging for money. You are not going to be some missionary and go overseas somewhere. You know what? You are written out of the will if you plan on doing that. You're not going to get any help from us. I have seen families choke out the life of God out of their young people because they have said ridiculously stupid things like that into their lives. I'll tell you what, I met a young lady. She went through our discipleship in Africa. She, she, is a, uh, she was a massage therapist when I met her, a very successful massage therap- therapist. She came from a family that is extremely wealthy. And, the, and she got saved. She got filled with the Holy Spirit. And she says, she came to a service that I was doing in the state in which she lives. And she said to me, she goes, I want to go overseas and I want to be disciple and I want to grow in the things of the gospel. Her family said, we're going to disown you if you go. And she said, I have to obey God. So she obeyed God, and she went over, and they disowned her completely. She found a great husband. She's got three beautiful kids. And guess what? The family went through all sorts of bad times and all the rest, and they've been asking her for her prayers. And now God's called them back, and they're now living in that same state. And guess who's taking care of the parents, and they're listening to everything that she's talking about right now? But you know what? God has anointed her, and God has blessed her and her husband because they would rather obey God than man. 
You know what? They're got to come. You know what? I always get amazed. I meet people and they're just nuts for God. They'll just, you know, worship goes on and they're like, oh yeah, uh huh. Until somebody that they've invited who's important to them comes to church service. And then they're sitting next to them. And in the middle of worship, instead of, oh, yeah, they start acting like this. And you're like, who is this person? What happened to you? It's like, this person's next to me. There are people in this room right now. You've invited people to come to church here at New Life. And you've said, oh, God, please, on a Sunday morning, you've prayed this prayer. Oh, God, please, this morning, can we please have a normal church service this morning, please, oh, God? Because this person is coming. And, God, I want them to think we're normal. And I want them to like me. Oh, God. Come on, you're laughing because you know that's true. (laughs) And you know that when you prayed that prayer, that God heard it. He does. He hears that prayer. And our God has the most amazing sense of humor. And when you pray that prayer, he's like, oh, oh, really? And then he calls the most crazy charismaniac who exists in all of the state of North Dakota and tells them to drive all night and come to New Life that particular morning. And he asked them to sit in a specific spot, which is usually right next to or right in front of the very person you're trying to impress. <laughs> and somewhere in the middle of service, that person, and it's always in the middle of worship, somewhere in the middle of worship, that person starts clucking like a chicken and acting like a jackhammer on their way to China. Bagak, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And you're like, I don't believe this. <laughs> And they're like, and all of a sudden feathers start showing up and you're like, I don't believe this. They're coming from everywhere. And if it's a woman, she usually reaches into her purse and literally pulls out a huge container of olive oil with a spray gun attachment and starts spraying the very person you're trying to impress while clucking like a chicken (laughs) in tongues. Does that even sound like a chicken? I have no idea what I'm doing. And they're spraying them and oil is dripping all over them. And you are like so mad and you're like, I will never come back to this church again. (laughs) And just when you're going to grab this person, you're going to look at them and go, oh my goodness, I forgot to look at the name over the church. This is not even my church. There are so many here. And you're about ready to take him by the hand and walk out, never to come back here again. When all of a sudden, pastor gets up and says, everybody, I feel like the Lord is moving. (laughs) And you're like, yeah, moving out the door. (laughs) And right about there, you're like, "Uh uh-huh, I'm never going back. And you're like, well, I'm going to get up and leave. But you know what? I mean, that would be impolite. So he's talking. So as soon as he's done, we're out of here. And the pastor says, you know, I just feeling right now like the Lord is while the person's still clucking and spraying them. (laughs) And Pastor says, I just feel like the Lord is touching people right now. And there are some of you out there, you've never given your life to Christ. Why don't you come to the altar right now? Because I know your heart is pounding and Jesus wants to save you. And the very first person that jumps up with oil dripping over them and feathers that came from somewhere comes running down to the front is your friend that you are trying to impress. (laughs) They're standing at the altar with feathers and oil. (laughs) And you stand up and you go, praise God, hallelujah, I knew that would happen. No, you didn't. (laughs) And God in the heavens laughs and he goes, (laughs) slaps an archangel a high five and it like evaporates. (laughs) Just (laughs) little flame ball. That's actually really funny when I think about it. But here this one, you know, does that. And all the while God chuckles and laughs and he reminds us all, he knows how to save people better than you do. Amen. 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 Can I get an amen? amen? My friends, we need to learn that we need to stop being impressed and dissuaded and persuaded by people because people become too important to us. They just do. You know what, guys? People are really little and our God is really big. Don Moen, in a great song that he sang so many years ago, he said in the, one of the lines of the song, I've made you too small in my eyes. Oh, Lord, forgive me, for I believe the lie. Be magnified, O Lord, for you are highly exalted. You know, that's the point, isn't it? Our God is so much bigger, and yet we're so intimidated by people. May the people be intimidated by God in you. Somebody shout amen. The, re- the reality is, guys, we should knock all this stuff off. You know what I mean? People really want to keep their decorum. I can never let anybody know that I'm a wild Pentecostal crazy and pray in tongues. I can't let people know that. Well, you know what? Wait until the day comes when God just comes on you so strong you can't shut your mouth. 
And remember, he does have this sense of humor, and that's going to happen sometime to maximize your embarrassment. (laughs) So better to do it in church and get loose and all the rest and just join in because we have a way of getting you. Um, Pastor Mark told a testimony on Tuesday at at the Bismarck Church. He told a testimony of a guy who for some reason couldn't answer the altar call on Monday, uh, Sunday night. I can't remember why. Something happened. And he really wanted to get filled with the Holy Spirit, but couldn't be at the altar to get filled. So he couldn't come to any other meetings. So on Tuesday morning, while he's in the parking lot in his truck at his workplace, the Spirit and glory of God filled his truck, and he got baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know what the moral of that story is? You can't get away. (laughs) We're coming for you. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's on. (laughs) We know where you live. Where are you going to go except in the middle of a field where we can see you anyway? (laughs) Listen, my friends. God knows how to achieve his end. Stop fearing people. You know what? That's a big thing that's going on in people in this room right now. You fear people too much and fear God too little. When you fear God, you don't fear people. You know, you're just, not, you're just not afraid of people. That's what makes it. My, people always tell me, oh, you're so bold. It's not that I'm so bold. I fear God. When you fear God, you really don't fear anything else. But if you don't fear God, you fear everything. So, you know, I don't get intimidated. That's why I woke up. I was, uh, recently, I was going on an airplane flight. And uh, I, I, it's too long of a story to tell. But the bottom line is there, were, there was a whole bunch of cancellations of flight and God got me through to where I was going overseas. But during one part, there was another delay, the umpteenth delay. And I was in uh, England, even though I wasn't scheduled, I had already flown to Frankfurt, I'm sorry, um, uh, Brussels, Belgium. But they flew me from Brussels to London so I could catch the flight to get down to where I was going in Africa. And so anyway, I, I'm, on, I'm in London not planning on being there and I'm in London Heathrow Airport and I'm waiting to board this plane which is now delayed and people are a little upset and I'm just waiting there and all of a sudden as I'm standing at this counter because I was just wanted to rest on something because I already been p- traveling for like 22 hours and so I'm just like l- just uh, like hang out looking at everybody who's getting mad and all the rest of the praying in tongues and all the rest and all of a sudden I realized I'm by an intercom system and I'm like wow I wonder if this works because there was they had two intercoms and there was one and all the people were at another one and I just assumed it wasn't working and I flicked on the switch and a green light came on and I'm like, hey, this thing works. I bet you these people could use an encouraging word. So I pulled it down and I said, listen, everyone, the Bible says in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord. And they let me, this British Airlines lady with this cute little bowler comes up to me and she goes, like this, like, one minute, please. And I said, I'm almost done. And I quoted the rest of the psalm, okay? So I finished the rest of the psalm, and I said, excuse me for a second. I said, yes, can I help you? Because <laughs> you know how they're always telling you that, right? And they're like, can I help you? And she goes, well, she said, that is quite not acceptable. So please, if you don't mind, stop doing that. She was so polite. I said, why, okay. <laughs> I said it back in, like, with an accent. And so I said, okay. I said, let me just apologize. I said, oh, I'm sorry, everybody. I guess I couldn't say that and people are laughing right I guess I couldn't say that but remember fly the friendly skies takes on a whole new meaning even though I know that's a united thing and not British air it does take a whole new meaning we're going to get so close to God flying at 38,000 feet it's why not say a few prayers it'll help everybody have a nice day and I got an ovation (laughs) they're all clapping and people are like giving me the thumbs up some Irish guy said something to me I knew it was English I had no idea what he was talking about (laughs) and he's saying this I'm like yeah You know, I do stuff like that, not because, well, it is because I'm crazy, but I mean, but the fact is, I was going to say, nobody would have believed that if I said that, but the fact is, I just don't fear people. The reason why is because I actually fear God. I fear the day that I stand, now listen, I'm not tormented by fear, I'm no longer a slave to fear, I have the right kind of fear, which is why I'm not a slave to fear. You know, you could have a fear that keeps you free from fear. When you fear God, you're like, hey, he's my dad. I fear him. He is awesome. He loves me. This is good. He's going to beat up anything that attacks me. I really have nothing to be afraid of, including all the people that intimidate us too much. I don't care how important they are. I've walked up to politicians and witnessed to them. I've done things in front of NATO personnel and the leaders of nations. And you know what? I give altar calls all the time because they all need Jesus. Are you hearing me? Stop fearing people. So Jesus, Jesus Then prays for him again. By the way, isn't that a lesson in itself? God doesn't just touch you once. He keeps touching you until the job's done. Some people come to an altar and we pray for them to get healed. And they're like, well, okay, I feel a little bit better, but I'm not completely well. Well, praise God. We'll pray for you again if it's not complete. Completed in the morning. Come on over again. We'll pray for you again. Because Jesus doesn't stop until the job is done. Come on. Somebody ought to clap your hands in Jesus' name. (laughs) Woo-hoo-hoo. 
boom shaka, laka, laka. Wow. That's not tongues. That was just me getting excited. Now hear this, right? The fact is, is that he then does one last thing. What does Jesus say to the guy to conclude this story so they will conclude our evening together and pray? What is the final thing Jesus does? What does he say to him? That's right. Don't go back to the village. Wait a minute. Doesn't that sound familiar? What did Jesus start by doing in this guy's life? Took him out of the village. And then what does he say at the end? Don't go back. You know what? What would happen when God sets you free from something and God takes you away from something and God delivers you out of something and God changes your life in something, this is where he repeats and amplifies the message. When God does it, he says, not only do I need to get you away from all your distractions so that I could speak to you and do something amazing in your life, but on top of that, I don't want you going back to that stuff ever again. Don't go back. You know what? Your Bible talks a lot about the disasters of people going back. A dog returns to its own vomit. A pig, after being washed, goes back to wallowing in the mire. Don't go back. We know that the guy who had the demons delivered out of him, the Bible says that the demons came back and he ended up seven times worse than before. The reality is don't go back. God set you free and does something in your life so that you might not return to those things because those things will have a very devastating effect in your life. Now, look, everybody be honest with me. We're in this house of God, so be honest, okay? How many of you agree with me that, you know what, God has, has had his hand extended to you for a very long time, and there are things that God has wanted to do in your life, but the fact is, you haven't, he hasn't been successful in getting you away from all of the distractions, hobbies, habits, and other things. How many of you realize there are too many distractions in your life? Come on, come on, be honest. Don't lie. This is God's house, right? How many of you agree with me on this, that God has to touch you and touch your eyes because people and especially situations that have happened in your life of late, that people have become too important, and yet maybe you just need to fear God a lot more than you've been fearing God. How many of you would agree that that's probably true in your life, that the spirit of the fear of the Lord needs to grow in your life? Come on, be honest. Let's, let's see your underarm stains, all right? Cool. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you would agree with me on this, that you find yourself, for some reason you don't know why, you find yourself returning back to things that God had really taken you away from, and you find them kind of slowly creeping back in your life, and you're like, you know... I just, I don't know why they're there, but I got to get these things out of my life again because they're beginning to come back in and I don't want them there. How many of you agree that's probably true about you and we need to pray for you in regards to that? Come on, be honest. Come on, get your hands up, right? Yeah, all over this place. All right, everybody stand up. I think we've all kind of done a wave of raising our hands for a variety of things. Now everybody stand up and come on up here. Come on, join me up here. All right, let's come to God's altar. Amen. I promise you, this is the briefest service we're going to have, but we're also going to pray for something (laughs) for everybody uh, because there's a Saturday night and there are two. When's the first service tomorrow morning? 8.30, 8.30, so it's going to be great, because I'm going to be totally awake, and if you want to come to that service and get woken up, I will be your caffeine. Amen. <laughs> now listen, I want to, <laughs> and everybody knows that's so true, I'm your double shot of espresso. <laughs> right. um, so, hey, let me kind of table that motion, amen. All right, all right. now, uh, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance leading, I mean, regarding all these issues, Amen. And then, I want to have a prayer because some of you uh, need to experience a real miracle because there's a number of people here, maybe you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, and God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Tomorrow, we're going to have a phenomenal day. And you know, if you want to come to all the services, it would be great because I'm actually not sharing the same message in both morning services because they're like, there are so many scriptures and so little time to preach them all. So it's going to be awesome to have two services. So there'll be two completely different messages. So you know, why not join us and have fun for the whole day? Amen? Just get extra coffee. Uh, you may actually, just listening to me, you may not need it. But anyway, so, but the point is, you can just get, have extra breakfast and you'll burn calories just listening to me. Amen. All right. Now, would you bow your heads and close your eyes, right? With heads bowed and eyes closed, would you put both of your hands on your heart and say this with me? Jesus, Jesus. I, repent. I repent. You've stretched out your hand. You've out your hand. And, I've and I've sinned because I haven't allowed you, allowed you. To, take to take me away. From all these distractions. But I'm reaching up to you. And I'm allowing you. To set me free. From all these things. That are destroying. Your work in my life. I surrender to you. And I ask you. Whatever is necessary. To remove these things. Whether they be ho- whether that they be ho- hobbies or habits, or relationships, or relationships, to remove them from my life, to them from my life. 
no matter the cost, because I declare, I want to hear your voice, know your mind, and understand you more than any other thing in my life. Jesus, change my heart. Give me a desire after you. Help me to follow you. Undistracted. Touch my eyes as you did the man's. Open them up so I could see others and be a friend like this blind man had friends. Bringing them to Jesus. Even tomorrow. To all the services. And the rest of my life. Inviting others to come to you. But set me free. From a spirit of intimidation. A man pleasing spirit. Deliver me O oh God. And set me free. Let me fear you. More than anything else. I receive right now into my own life, into my family, into my church, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit, increase your work in my life and teach me that I might fear the Lord. And Almighty God, I confess. Some of the things of the past, I have allowed them to creep back in. I've walked back to the village. But tonight, I set my face on the exit. And I'm walking out, never to return again. Give me the strength to get all the way out and burn the bridge of my connection to those things once again in Jesus name I thank you for your mercy I thank you for your grace in your name amen now clap your hands and rejoice as a thank you to God Everyone lift up your hands. Come on, lift up your hands like this. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood over each and every one of these people. I loose them right now in Jesus' name. I command those strangleholds that have kind of come back around them to be broken in the name of Jesus. Almighty God, I thank you, Lord God, for truly removing all those bondages to distractions that have kept them from the precious life that you have for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, O oh God, for directing their steps in the holy and the right way, O oh God. And Lord God, in a way that's going to be so awesome and so incredible. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this in the name of Jesus. I thank you they'll not serve themselves nor the devil, not for five seconds the rest of their days. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Come on, clap your hands one more time in Jesus' name. You know what the cool thing is? The cool thing is God actually offers the power so you could live this out. You know, I've always said this. I always feel like it's the worst thing in the world to preach the gospel, tell people what God expects of them, how he wants to take them out of the village of their own stuff and kind of deliver them from all that stuff without offering them the power to pull it off. You cannot achieve the freedom that God wants apart from the power. That's why Jesus told his disciples, don't go anywhere until you're clothed with power from on high. Amen? Amen. You listen, I mean, I, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I was after, like two weeks after I got saved. Then I regret that I waited two weeks to get filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what? God, Jesus told his disciples, don't go anywhere. My boys, my one got, got filled with the Holy Spirit at the age of three while sitting on my lap at the West Acres Mall in Fargo. He was sitting on my lap. He spontaneously erupted praying in other tongues. You know what, there, there used to be, and it's wrong to do this, it's betting, but they, they, they used to, the people who knew us had a pool going on because they believed that our kids' first words would be in tongues, not in English, because that's how much we pray in tongues in our house. And my, my son, Luke, we're not sure, we think it was five years old, we just know that when he was five, we were walking back and forth in a prayer meeting holding hands together, he was swinging back and forth, and Carol goes, look, and you know, we would hold him up, and he would walk back and forth in the prayer meeting with us, and he was walking back and forth, and I looked down, and Luke was praying in tongues. Carol leaned down and said, honey, how long have you been doing that? He goes, I don't know. 
He just loved it. So my boys have been praying since three and five years old in other tongues. And you know what? That has saved them from a whole bunch of stuff in their lives. Amen? We must get filled. Jesus said, don't go anywhere until you receive this. Now look, people say, well, I don't think it's for everybody. Oh, so you don't think everybody should have a powerful prayer life? The Bible says you're weak and you don't know how to pray as you should. You don't. You know what's wrong with your prayers? Your prayers are filled with you. And they're filled with the way you look at things. Does that make sense? Like there are times I'm driving and I get cut off on the road and I feel like it's God's will for that person to go see him right away. <laughs> How many of you know that is not always the will of God? <laughs> and very rarely the will of God, <laughs> all right? But the fact is I prayed that prayer. Oh God, take this be a little sinner, throw him hole into hell to warm your feet on a cold winter day. But that is not an appropriate prayer. You know what? When I pray in tongues, then I know I'm praying the will of God. Because the Bible says in Romans 8, 26 and 27, when you pray in tongues, your head may not understand what you're saying, but the Spirit understands, and God understands what's being prayed because he's praying the will of God perfectly through you. You know, somebody would say to me, what good does it do if you're praying a language you don't understand? I mean, why, why would that benefit you? I love what Carol says about that. She always looks at people and says, you know what? If you heard half the things God was praying through you, you would probably stop praying and say, don't pray that through me, God. That's never going to happen. We stop God because he prays bigger prayers regarding our lives than we have ever prayed ourselves. Even if you just got saved, literally, if you just, this first time you've ever said a prayer of repentance in your life, you're a roadkill for this. You're, you're all set up. Amen. <laughs> God fills people. You know what, guys? If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, God wants to fill you right now. How is that going to happen? Well, thanks for asking. This is how it's going to happen. In the name of Jesus, if you've never been filled, in just a second, I'm going to have you all bow your heads, close your eyes in just a second, and we're going to concentrate. And if you want to get filled, then what I'm going to have you do is you're going to step forward. We're going to lay our hands on you. It's kind of like a Holy Ghost game, a twister, and you're the board. It's so much fun. And then we're going to lay our hands on you, and I'm going to see a prayer over you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. God's going to fill you. We're all going to pray in tongues. Then everybody goes home to eat. Amen. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Amen. Right, God wants to fill you. So bow your heads, close your eyes, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus, right now I thank you and I praise you for filling people, that you're going to fill people with the Holy Spirit. I come against all, all hindrances, all roadblocks, all bad teachings, bad misunderstandings. I just lose people right now to get filled to overflowing. In Jesus' name, I rebuke the spirit of chicken heartedness in the name of Jesus. I'm not actually convinced that is a spirit, but I rebuke it anyway in Jesus' name. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, praying in other tongues, you say, Dean, I know my prayer life is weak. I don't have supernatural power in my life. Man, I don't want to go back into the village of all that unbelief and all that other junk, and I see that stuff happening always in my life. Man, I'm just going to take Jesus by the hand and follow him in this. And, and look, you may say to yourself, heads bowed, eyes closed. You may say to yourself, hey, I don't completely understand it. So what? Get filled, pray in tongues. We'll explain it more to you afterwards. Amen. What else more do you need? God said, don't go anywhere until you get this. Amen. This is for each and every person. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, praying in other tongues, and you really want it, if that's you, you say, man, dude, I've never done it. I really want to receive this. If that's you, in the name of Jesus, on the count of three, I want you to lift up your hand. One, two, three. Lift them in Jesus' name. Oh, yeah. Those of you lifting your hands, would you please step up here right now? Come on and join me. Come on. Come on. I saw those hands. Come on up here. Come on. Yeah, come on up here. Come on. Let's give it up for these people who are coming forward. Come on. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, right here. Yeah, right here. woo -hoo! Amen. Amen. Aren't you, like, excited for them? Come on. Right? Come on, thank you, Jesus. Now, this is what we're going to do. If you're like really pumped up, pumped, ew, um, guys, this is not just me praying for people. Let's all pray for that, right? So get your hands on, on them. And if you can't get your hands on them, get your hands on somebody who's got their hands on somebody else who's got their hands on somebody else who's got their hands on them. Amen? Got it? So come on, come closer. Come on, come closer. Come on, you guys. I need your help. Come on, get your hands on people. Come on, lay your hands. No, oh, I just love you guys. You're all like majorly squishy and I can't take it. Okay, all right. <laughs> Now, this is what's going to happen, okay? In just a second, I'm going to say a prayer over you, okay? I'm sorry I'm smiling. It's just like I know what's going to happen. I'm trying not to be overly hyper, but I'm like so stoked right now. All right, here's this is what's going to happen. I'm going to lay my hands on you so you're going to feel some pressure on your head. So when you do, don't freak out. And if you know martial arts, don't hurt me, okay? All right, so oh, I'm going to have my hands on you. I'm going to say a prayer over you. And then I'm going to have you repeat a prayer after me. In fact, we'll all help you by all repeating that prayer together, okay? When you're done repeating that prayer, I'm going to say in my very boisterous sounding voice, the English word, speak. When I shout speak, at that instant, God's going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Like the power switch in heaven's going to get turned on. It's going to be downloaded. It's like, oh, awesome. All right. So when I shout speak, though, it's also a command for you to open your mouth and? That's right. So when I shout speak, at that instant, we're going to partner with God for a miracle. 
See, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. You know, I had a guy look at me and tell me, he said, um, but that was me speaking in tongues. And I'm like, who else would be doing it except you? It's you actually partnering with God. I mean, think about it. God says, lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. So our job is to lay hands on them, but God heals them. He's got the hard part. In this case, when I say speak, all you have to do is lift up your voice, and let's just all join together. And believe me, you're not going to be saying what anybody else is saying in tongues. We're all going to just take off in tongues together. How cool is that? Amen? All right? One last scripture. In Luke chapter 11, it says this. If your parents and your children ask you for something they need that's good, are you going to say no to them, yes or no? No, you're going to say yes, of course, to them. If they ask you for a loaf of bread, are you going to give them a scorpion instead? No, you're going to give them that loaf of bread because you know they need to eat. How much more, the Bible says in Luke 11, will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So when you ask, this is basically his way of saying, you're totally guaranteed to get this. So there's no doubt about it. Amen? So when I shout speak, let's all take off together. Now, okay, I'm totally Greek, which means I'm talkative. And I even talk in my sleep. In fact, I'm taking a nap right now. But the <laughs> fact is, what's your background? Like, ethnically. Are you Norwegian, Swedish? Norwegian. Norwegian. What are you? German. Okay. If there were Norwegians and Germans in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they would have called it the month of Pentecost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it would have taken God three and a half weeks to say, can you please open your mouth and express yourself? <laughs> All right. So... But there were, there were people more like me. Okay, so ethnically speaking, we're going to go past and you're going to get in contact with your little inner Greek. Okay? <laughs> All right. So when I say speak, I love you so much. When I say speak, okay, I was going to lick you. You're so lucky. Here, um, when I say speak, okay, when I say speak, you can't do this. Don't go, mm. Because God is not going to crank your mouth open. You have to be vocal. The only way you can be vocal is if you actually move your lips. The only people that could talk without moving their lips are ventriloquists. And how freaky weird would that be if the dummy got it and you didn't? I mean, the dummy's going you know, like, that is so weird. So when I say speak, okay, let's all lift up our voices together and pray in tongues together. Trust me, it's coming from God and you together. Amen? Does that make sense? If it does, say yes. Yes, yes what? Sir? No, okay.